All right, so here is a statement of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? It says, if you've got a function which is continuous on this closed interval from A to B, and you define this new function as the integral starting at A and ending at some x, right? And here we should specify that x is somewhere between A and B. As long as big F is equal to this integral, then the derivative of big F will be equal to little f. Okay? So w what this is saying is that this integral, so defined, is an antiderivative of the function you started with, right? It's not, it's not the indefinite integral necessarily, right? It's, it's not the most general antiderivative. It's, it's one among this family of possible antiderivatives, right? Um, in fact, if we're comparing this to all possible antiderivatives, we sort of know which one it's got to be because one of the things we know about this function is that f of a is zero, right? Because if I put x equal to a, remember that whenever the upper and lower limits are the same, you know, you don't have any area, right? If you slide x all the way down to a, there's no base for your region, so you have no area, all right? So you actually know which among the family of all the possible antiderivatives, you know which one it is. It's the one where the constant is chosen to make f of a equal to zero. Okay. So this is an important result because it tells you that every continuous function has an antiderivative, right? Even if you can't find it, even if you don't know how to write it down by other means, you can define it as an integral. And we will see examples of functions where you can't necessarily come up with an antiderivative in terms of functions that you're used to, like trig functions and exponentials and polynomials and logarithms and things like that. Uh, it might be that the only way you can actually express that antiderivative is through the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? We'll see some examples like that as we go on. All right. Now, if all you wanted to see was the statement of the theorem, and you want to move on to examples, you can stop the video now and, and, and go on to the next thing. If you, want to, if you want to see an argument as to why this is true, and it seems like, you know, for a fundamental theorem, right, we don't prove everything in this course, but for the fundamental theorem, it seems like maybe we should stop and, and try to understand why this is true. Okay? So, let's look at a proof. Okay? Well, how do we normally calculate a derivative if we know nothing else? All right? We know that big F prime should be the limit, h going to zero, big F at x plus h minus big F at x over h. Okay. Well, what exactly do I have going on in this limit? Okay, 1 over h out front. Uh, what is f of x plus h? That's going to be the integral from a to x plus h, f of t dt, minus the integral from a to x of f of t dt. All right, just plug in the definition of the function. All right. We know it's a perfectly good function, so if it's going to have a derivative, this is how we're going to find it. All right. Now, remember another property of integrals. If you switch the upper and lower limits, you get a sign change, right? So minus integral from a to x is the same thing as doing plus the integral from x to a. All right. Um, oh, and then we have one more property of integrals. If these two match, right, I can do the integral from a to x plus h, right, and then the integral from a to x, right, I can combine these into a single integral, right? Um, we're going from x to a and then from a to x plus h. We can combine this as a single integral. We can write this as the limit h going to 0, 1 over h, integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt, right? So what you should have in mind here is that here's your x. 
here's your x plus h, right? So you have this, this tiny, tiny, tiny strip here, right? And we know that the width, the width is h, right? And the height, well, the height is roughly f of x, except, you know, as we can see in this picture, right, the height is different at the two endpoints, right? Should we be doing f of x? Should we be doing f of x plus h? Um, well, I don't know. But if we think of it, if we just kind of take, think of this as a rectangle, width times height, f of x times h, and then we divide by h, we expect that we should get f of x, right? Which is what we're trying to show. We're trying to show that we get f of x, right? Um, so here's where continuity comes in, right? f is continuous on this interval from x to x plus h, right? So I'm assuming that h is positive. If h is negative, we go from x plus h to x, right? We, we go on the other side. Um, since it's continuous, remember the extreme value theorem. We know that there's going to be some C1, which is the absolute minimum. There's going to be some C2, which is the absolute maximum. And f of t has to be in between, right? Um, for all t between x and x plus h, right? And of course, C1 and C2 are also in that interval. Okay? And, and so now you kind of play around with properties of integrals and you say, okay, well, if, if I just put in, so f of c1 is some constant, right? It's a, it's a constant value. Um, if I were to put a constant in here, I would just get that constant value times the width, right? I would get f of c1 times h, right? And then I'm going, you know, I've, I've got that 1 over h. So what happens is from here, we get that the integral from x to x plus h of f of c1 is less than or equal to the integral from x to x plus h of f of t, okay, which is less than or equal to the integral from x to x plus h of f of c2, right? And I'm assuming that h is positive, so this inequality remains valid if I multiply by 1 over h everywhere, okay? And then we say, oh, but this, this first integral here, we just said this whole thing is just f of c1 times h, right? This one here is just f of c2 times h. We're dividing by h. So what we get is that f of c1 is less than or equal to 1 over h integral from x to x plus h f of t dt less than or equal to f of c2, right? And that's going to be valid for, for any positive h. So now we remember what were we doing? We're letting h go to 0. Okay, so what happens when h goes to 0? Well, c1 and c2 are in this interval, right? So as h goes to 0, C1 and C2, they're squeezed in between x and x plus h. So as you shrink this down, C1 and C2, they have to be getting close to x, right? They have to be getting very close to x. And since f is continuous, if C1 is going to x, f of C1 has to go to f of x. Since C2 is going to x, f of C2 has to be going to f of x. Um, okay, so the limit of this as h goes to 0 is f of x. The limit of this as h goes to 0 is f of x. Okay. This is in between. Remember the squeeze theorem. Squeeze theorem says 
that if we let take the limit as h goes to 0, which is f prime of x, big F prime, what we have to get is little f. Okay? So that's roughly the argument for the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Next, we'll look at some examples.